I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, microscopic bugs destroying a business faster than any police raid. The growing challenge forcing state and federal experts to work together. The San Diego's Treasury owe you money. I'm Peggy Pico with how to find out if it belongs to you and where the money goes if it's not claimed. Also ahead, new research reveals dolphins could hold the key to diabetes prevention in people. The surprising diet link between us and them. Feminism, zombies and pole dancing, the strange bedfellows celebrating art on stage and beyond. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Round one of a legal fight in the high-stakes world of Alzheimer's research goes to UC San Diego. A judge told USC to return a research database to, US, to UC San Diego today. KPBS science reporter David Wagner says the universities went to court after a prominent scientist abruptly resigned. The judge sided with UC San Diego today in a fight for control over a major national Alzheimer's research program. Paul Asen directed the program at UC San Diego until last month when he resigned and took a new job at USC. UC San Diego says Asen conspired to take this entire program with him to USC. They say he transferred all the research data to a personal account and locked UC San Diego out of a program they rightfully own. USC has argued that database should not be returned because UC San Diego cannot competently manage it. Here's what USC's attorney said in court today about why Paul Asen should remain in control of the database. Because he is the guy, he developed the secret sauce, he's been managing it for years, and these studies are too important to trust to amateurs. UC San Diego's lawyer said that argument was offensive, and he said federal grants clearly state this research program belongs to UC San Diego. A final ruling has not been made in the case, but the judge did say today she believes UC San Diego was highly likely to prevail on the merits of the case. David Wagner, KPBS News. Another blow against the right to die movement in California. A San Diego County judge poised to dismiss a lawsuit filed by a single mom who wants to make assisted suicide legal for terminally ill patients who want it. Christy O'Donnell filed the lawsuit. Her doctor says she only has a few months to live. The judge said today the lawsuit is asking for a new law. He's expected to issue a written decision Monday. There was an assisted suicide bill at the state capitol, but a Catholic church campaign helped stall it this month. New changes under Prop 47, a California court has ruled San Diego District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis must extend Prop 47 to minors. The voter-approved measure reclassified some felonies to misdemeanors, ranging from shoplifting to grand theft. KPBS reporter Megan Burks joins us with more. Megan, first remind us what Prop 47 does. Well, voters overwhelmingly approved Prop 47 in 2014. The measure reclassifies some nonviolent felonies as misdemeanors and offers reduced sentences to match. And why is Dumanis at the center of this uh, court case on the law? Well, since the law was passed, thousands of adult inmates have been released under the law. But earlier this year, Dumanis rejected new sentencing requests from dozens of local juveniles. She argued Prop 47 doesn't apply to minors because it uses terms that are specific to adult court. For instance, adults are convicted, whereas minors are adjudicated. And nowhere in the law is adjudication mentioned. And where did the judge come down on this matter? Well, on Thursday, a San Francisco judge rejected that interpretation, essentially siding fully with civil rights groups working on the case. Let's hear from one of the attorneys. The drafters never intended that the law would be applied narrowly and have the result, the absurd result, in that the law would be treating juveniles more harshly than it treats adults. The judge also agreed that any DNA collected from juveniles should be destroyed if their felony is reduced to a misdemeanor. That sort of evidence is not taken for misdemeanors. And Megan, what does Dumanis say about all this? It's unclear whether Dumanis will appeal the decision. In a statement, she says her office supports a juvenile justice system focused on rehabilitation and the best interest of minors, and that her office works to keep kids out of the criminal justice system through diversionary programs. 
KPBS reporter Megan Burks. Border Patrol officials say by the end of the year, they'll decide whether or not officers should use body cameras. They recently completed a feasibility study on the technology after complaints of excessive use of force by agents against immigrants. The report suggests the agency needs options because of the varied working environments. In other words, a one-size-fits-all approach is unlikely. A community in mourning today following a deadly shooting attack at a Louisiana movie theater. Questions remain, though, over why the gunman opened fire. Two women were killed, nine others injured last night during a screening of the comedy train wreck. Police say the gunman, John Hauser, shot and killed himself when police arrived on scene. Hauser had a history of mental health issues. They're pushing back social media giants. Twitter, Facebook, and Google are fighting a Senate bill requiring them to alert federal authorities of any terrorist activity. Now, company leaders met with lawmakers on Capitol Hill. They say they already ban content like beheadings and alert law enforcement if they suspect someone might get hurt. They're worried about the bill being too broad. Tech officials say the bill could place them on the hook legally if they miss a social media update hinting at an attack. They could do more damage than a police raid, a new challenge for the marijuana business in Colorado, creating costly problems for growers. Associated Press reporter Peter Banda shows us the dangers behind pests and pesticides. As Colorado pot growers go mainstream, from basements to commercial warehouses, they face a new challenge, microscopic bugs and mildew that could destroy their business faster than any police raid. Well, once it's in one plant and it starts representing itself, it spores, it, it creates these spores that float all throughout the room. Because the crop has been illegal for so long, neither growers nor scientists have any reliable research to fight infestations. Some are turning to chemicals, including microbutanil, okay for use on crops such as grapes, but not okay to burn because it turns to cyanide. That's a problem because of the wide variety of uses for marijuana. Many of these pesticides, if you look at their material safety data sheet, where they mention the dangers of burning, it usually has to do with firefighting precautions. Because, it, you know, if pesticides are stored somewhere and if they get lit on fire, that becomes the issue. Denver marijuana regulators this spring quarantined plants from 11 growing facilities suspected of using toxic pesticides. Unlike other crops, um, you don't smoke tomatoes, you don't smoke grapes, um, you don't extract those into oil products that'll be um, either used through dermal Sorry. products, for, through lotions, or um, uh, infused into other foods. The Colorado Department of Agriculture is working with the EPA and the industry while the state develops rules governing pesticide use. And we do think that will ultimately set the standard um, that as other states face this, they'll see as far as what our approach has been and what Washington State's approach has been. Marijuana growing consultant Michael Lee sees the lack of approved pesticides as a good thing. It will be a win for the whole industry and it will push people to be innovative. Innovation for an industry considered illegal under federal law. Peter Banda, Associated Press, Denver. The largest female surf contest in the world is being held at Oceanside Pier. The three-day event is the only one scheduled in the U.S. this year. For the eighth year in a row, San Diego is hosting the Supergirl Pro Surfing Competition, where 108 women from around the world are competing for a spot in next year's World Championship Tour. But only 16 will qualify. Ellie Jean Coffey is from Australia. Basically, you have 20 minutes and you've got to catch as many waves as you want, but only two waves are going to be scored, and then those two waves combined uh, wins you or loses you the heat. She's already ranked 16th in the world and says she loves meeting new people and traveling, but surfing can also be risky. The toughest thing about surfing is getting scared of sharks and the pressures that come with competitions. Teen sisters Avalon and Sydney Johnson come from a surfing family in Carlsbad. They've been shredding since the age of two. Yeah, we're like one of the few locals in it. They really like the all-women's competition, but say they also miss seeing the guys. I feel like the boys kind of help push you to do better in a way. Like, you kind of feel like you watch them and you kind of learn, and then you go out and you try to be like them. And I find it really helpful when they're around, so. 
Okay. But at the same time, it does give us girls a chance to say, we can surf very well and um, we can hold our own ground in the sport. In addition to surfing, there's the Festival Village with music, art, hairstyling, even food. Spectators gathered on top of the pier and line the south side of the beach in Oceanside to get a look at the world's top women surfers competing for $10,000 and the most iconic trophy in surfing, the pink Supergirl cape. I hope that I win, obviously. I hope that I be the Supergirl. <laughs> yeah. 45 of the top 50 female surfers are competing through Sunday, and the event is free to the public and will be televised. What do dolphins, diabetes, and butter have in common? Peggy Pico speaks to a San Diego researcher working to unlock the mystery. The National Marine Mammal Foundation study discovered that just like people, bottlenose dolphins develop metabolic syndrome and diabetes-like symptoms. But dolphins who ate certain fish could reverse the disorder. Joining me with how the findings could translate to improving health in humans is my guest, veterinarian Stephanie Van Watson, director of translational medicine and research at the National Marine Mammal Foundation. And Stephanie, what exactly did you find in bottlenose dolphins that could be linked to preventing diabetes and metabolic syndrome in humans? Sure, well, what we have found over the last few years, Peggy, is that dolphins, just like humans, can get this disease called metabolic syndrome, and that is blood changes, like higher insulin, higher triglycerides. And because there are studies in humans that show some studies in humans that show that if you eat a lot of fish, you might be protected against getting this disease. Other studies had, didn't show that effect, and even others suggested that fish might be increase your risk of metabolic syndrome. And so since we at the foundation protect and care for dolphins, which eat only fish, we thought we would look at uh, the fish and the dolphins and see if we can unlock the secret part of fish that may be protective against dolphins. And so you did. So the study was conducted then at the uh, foundation with how many dolphins? That's right, we had 49 dolphins in the study and it was a mix of wild dolphins from Sarasota Bay, Florida, and then also a handful 30 dolphins actually from the Navy's program. And what did you find as far as uh, fish, uh, the kind of fish that they ate, the fatty acid link, and how that might relate to people? Sure, so because of the, a lot of excitement, it's hard to go to the grocery store and not see fish oil pills with omega-3 fatty acids, which come from fish. So we looked at 55 fatty acids in the fish and the, uh, that the dolphins ate and the blood, and we were very surprised to find that there was a saturated fat called heptadecanoic acid. You and I will call it C17. Yes, <laughs> C17 fatty acid, okay. Uh, and, uh, and dolphins with higher levels of C17 in their blood had lower, healthier levels of insulin. And where did the dolphins get it? The dolphins get it from the fish. So not all fish have C17, which might be the secret of why some studies in humans worked and some didn't. That, uh, for example, capelin, a fish that's commonly fed to Navy dolphins, had no detectable C17, while mullet and pinfish, common fish in Sarasota Bay, Florida, had high levels of C17. What about people? Where can they get this C17 fatty acid? So this is my favorite part of the study. <laughs> of the study. Uh, C17 is present in uh, at some fish, we know that. Dairy fat, so that includes whole fat milk, uh, yogurt, as well as butter. And then there are some studies showing in rye. There are probably more foods with C17, but we hope to learn more soon. So people are going to be watching this, people who like milk and eat yogurt. So they just go out and start powerhousing on, you know, whole milk and yogurt? We're not ready there. We're not there yet. So the studies are early, and there are actually some interesting and compelling uh, large based human population studies in Europe and Japan that support what we found that showed that people with higher levels of C17 in their blood are less likely to develop prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. So it's encouraging that these two different uh, populations and studies are coming together. Why wouldn't people have enough of this C17 uh, protein? You know, they, like I said, they eat the yogurt, they drink the milk, so why wouldn't we already be covered on that? Well, we had that exact same question, and because C17 is present in dairy fat, we went to the grocery store, pulled some products off the shelf, and we tested a non-fat, low-fat, whole-fat uh, dairy products and butter, and we found that non-fat dairy products had no C17 in it. It needed the fat in it. Low fat had some, whole fat more, and butter had six times higher levels of C17 even compared to whole fat.
But again, we're not ready to go out and eat, uh, you know, a pound of butter right now because we're not sure uh, there's more study to be done. There's a lot more studies to be done. And also, butter, other products may have good saturated fats and bad saturated fats. So we're really sitting and waiting to hear uh, how the science pans out with our collaborators. And you have another study coming up with children. We do. So we're looking at children uh, and working with children's hospitals here in San Diego and elsewhere. And we're starting with a, the same hypothesis we had with dolphins, that do children who have metabolic syndrome have lower C17 compared to children who don't? And if they do, we could do diet studies to increase their C17 intake and see if we saw the same alleviation of metabolic syndrome. All right, very interesting. Veterinarian Stephanie Van Watson, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Peggy. A makeover for food nutrition labels. The FDA is proposing a new line to include the percent daily value for the recommended daily intake of sugar. Labels now include daily values for other nutrients, but not for added sugars. FDA says it would help consumers know how much sugar is okay to eat. The sugar industry says there isn't enough science to justify the proposal. A ruling on what the new label will look like is expected after comments from the public are reviewed. Signs of a rush to consolidate in the health care industry. Anthem, the second largest health insurer in the country, announced plans to buy rival Cigna today. The price tag, $48 billion. The mega merger would cover 53 million customers. The deal comes as the insurance industry grapples with rapid changes, including the ripple effects of the federal health care reform. California's health insurance market will become a bit more competitive next year. Two additional companies plan to sell products through Covered California. Oscar will market its policies in Los Angeles and Orange Counties. United Health will offer coverage in primarily rural counties where consumers have few choices. Covered California will announce its premium rate increases on Monday. The open enrollment period begins in November. Qualcomm announces painful layoffs and a possible restructure. A local judge says UCSD denied an accused student a fair hearing on an assault charge. And can the Balboa Park Conservancy raise the millions needed for urgent repairs? Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. There's some free money that may have your name on it. More than $400,000 in property tax refunds and other monies are unclaimed in San Diego County. Earlier, Peggy Pico found out what to do if any of the money belongs to you. If you suspect you're owed a refund from the county, you have until September 8th of this year to make a claim. After that, all remaining money will go into the county's general fund. Joining me to find out what you need to do to check and apply for refunds is San Diego County's treasurer, tax collector, Dan McAllister. And Dan, more than $400,000 uh, of unclaimed refunds, I understand, are sitting in the county's uh, bank. That's correct. So uh, where does that money come from? Well, just about 413 to be very precise this year. $413,000 is money that people either overpaid when they paid their property taxes uh, and are owed a refund for that. And that could have happened any time in the last four years or so. So it's important that people go back and check their records, check their checks to make sure that they didn't overpay. And if they did or think they might, of, they can come onto our website, they can go onto our phone line, and they can check very easily alphabetically. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in more detail, but you have a binder here yes, full of people and names of uh, people that are owed money. How many people? Well, there are a ton of people, and let me just tell you that it's in the hundreds uh, where property taxes are concerned. It's about 652 people, as a matter of fact, for property tax refunds. And then we have another group of people who are owed refunds for deposits and things of that sort and that amounts to another several hundred as well. Um, the average uh, real estate refund is over $400 that people are owed for overpayment of property taxes. And the average, in terms of the smaller amounts, uh, winnows down substantially uh, to about $103. Is, is so, the average of what you might, right. might be that's sitting right. there that, that you're owed. Well, why would so many people actually overpay on property taxes? Well, I'll tell you that in one case, for instance, the last five or six years where the down economy has driven down value valuations on property. People pay in advance. They pay what was billed the year before and therefore they overpay. And if they ask for an assessment appeal, they might have it granted at some point in the next year or so. And that means we owe them money back. 
Okay, well, let's get back to that. You know, if you want to know how the if the county owes you money and, yes. and walk us through the steps with that. What do you do to check and, and what do you need to do to, to claim a refund? It's a very straightforward process. We ask that people go online first. They can do that 24 7. Uh, www.sdtreasetax.com. That's S D T R E A S tax.com. On the website, we have two lists. One list is the real estate taxes that people may have overpaid, and the other is a list of fees that people might have been charged that were refundable fees that maybe they didn't realize were refundable, and those would uh, inure as a result of business with the county in the last three years. So you so. go online and you find your name and you're like, That's yippee. Correct. And That's then right. and then what? Well, and then what? You contact us directly, either come in person or uh, contact us by the phone mm -hmm. number, and uh, you will be able to speak with a person, and uh, you give the details to the person. Uh, you have to present ID and proof that you are who you say you are and that you're not just the same or another Smith may be listed in the sure, book. Sure, sure. Uh, but that's how the process works. And if we can verify authenticity, uh, we can turn a refund around in about a week or two. Okay. Very cool. Um, I have a question, though. Since the county has this this uh, massive sure. list of m money yes. uh, owed yes. to people and, and who these people are and mm -hmm. their names, why not just cut them a check and send it out? We have. In fact, in many of these cases, we've sent checks two or three or four times. Uh, we find that people are very mobile in San Diego. People change addresses, people sell homes, people buy new homes, they move to duplexes, they move to fourplexes, they move to condos, they downsize, they do all kinds of things. So sometimes in the shuffle, uh, these payments or these overpayments get lost and people forget that they are owed the money. So specifically, remind us, so this money each year, it, there's a, a, a cachet of money, yes. we should say, and then and then it goes to the uh, county's general fund, and then uh, how, how does that work? Is it spent on specific things, or is it just well, bonus? In the, in this case, if the $413,000 is not claimed by September 8th, we will then initiate a process called as cheatment, which sends that money back to the general fund of the county. And then it's up to the decision makers and the policy makers, the Board of Supervisors, to decide how that money is going to be used. All right. County Treasurer, Tax Collector Dan McAllister, thank you so much for the update. Pleasure. Thank you. And I want to let folks know one more time uh, to check the uh, final notice list and claim an owed refund. Uh, go to sdtrestax.com or call the Treasurer's Office. The number's on your screen at 877-829-4732. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Comedian Aziz Ansari on his new best selling book, Modern Romance. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. San Diego International Fringe Festival promises 11 days of eyeball busting shows. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando says that's an accurate description. <laughs> The San Diego International Fringe Festival kicked off its third year last night to appreciative crowds. Founder and executive director Kevin Charles Patterson advises theater goers to get ready for a big adventure. Get ready to go see things that you normally wouldn't see. The fact that the festival is so accessible price-wise, they can go see some shows for free, uh, up to the most expensive ticket is $10. So they can go see a circus show in the morning, see a dance show in the afternoon, see a play later that afternoon, in the evening go see a musical. A musical like Les Midge, an unexpected journey of Hobbit proportions, which mashes up Les Miserables and Tolkien by way of Hollywood. Do you hear the small ones sing, sing at the start of their long quest? It is the music of some dudes who all stand three foot four at best. This year, the festival has expanded to 18 different venues, says Patterson. One of the big differences uh, this year is we are adding venues in Mexico, so that's extra exciting. One returning venue is Lay Girls in Point Loma, where you can find the uniquely talented Kate McGrew and her show, Hooker P.I. It's the story of a sex worker whose client dies while they're having sex during their session, and so she has to devise a plan to hide both of them from a pack of zombie radical feminists who roam the streets enslaving clients and eating hookers for strength. And it's singing, rapping, and pole dancing. That's right, feminism and pole dancing. McGrew won the Fringe on Fire Award last year and has traveled from Dublin to make her second appearance at San Diego Fringe. 
But not all the performers have traveled from abroad. Jacob Sarovsky is from San Diego, and at 17, he's the youngest playwright at Fringe. Well, I'm the producer of my show titled My Mother's in the Audience. It's a dark comedy about four stage moms who engage in a deadly competition in order to win the coveted prize of best parental coordinator. It's a combination of my obsession with Shakespeare. Ah! She should have died here after. And my experience backstage in theater. Philip Megan stars as Macbeth in the play within the play. The trick to performing bad Shakespeare is to know all the rules so then you can break all the rules. One of the most important elements early on when I was being directed by Jason Maddy was that we went over all the monologues the correct way and so we could pin together like different areas where I could mispronounce words, screw up the scansion in the verse and just go straight forward in like the most horrendous Shakespeare so its comedic value and timing could just be perfect. The 2015 San Diego International Fringe Festival provides sensory overload through August 2nd. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. And San Diego International Fringe continues, as she mentioned, through August 2nd at 18 different venues. Of course, you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night and a great weekend.